Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fifth Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 2nd, 2021, are from Acts chapter 8, 26 through 40, Psalm 22, 25 through 31. The second reading continues our journey through 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. And we move into the farewell discourse in John chapter 15, 1 through 8. So my introduction set up my first point, which is uh, the importance of recognizing this uh, metaphor and this, uh, this introduction of this idea of Jesus as the true vine uh, in the farewell discourse, because uh, this, is a, this is called the farewell discourse because Jesus is saying goodbye, but it's a very troubling uh, and, and pastoral moment for Jesus, that this is, this is when Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples of saying, I am leaving you. I'm not going to leave you orphaned, of course, but I am leaving you. And so there's the language around uh, hearts being troubled and do not be, do not be a fearful, do not be afraid. Uh, and, and, and it's into this pastoral uh, moment that Jesus offers this last image of that it's the last I am in the gospel of John with the predicate nominative. And it's this, this last image that he leaves his disciples with, uh, with this idea of this uh, in extraordinary dependence on the vine and reliance on, on the vine uh, as branches connected to the vine. And how is it that they then can hold on to that promise as, uh, as, as we move forward in the gospel in chapter 16, when Jesus talks about, you know, you will be put out in the synagogue and, uh, and then of course, moving into the events of the passion. So it's a, uh, it's a, a, a deeply relational image, uh, a, 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 a mutual dependence kind of image, uh, but to take it out of the farewell discourse, it doesn't really then do it justice. So that's, that's my, that's my first point. My first point, there are more to come. So I believe I, I, there might be. What, so how does, is this, is it important that this passage is, is part of the discourse because of what Jesus has to say about the spirit? Now I know the spirit's not necessarily here, but I mean, he's, is there something about this deeply relational, this kind of linking like a vine has to a branch that's crucial so that we understand kind of identity or life or ministry when Jesus is not physically present among us? You see what I mean? Like the whole discourse is setting up time when he's gonna be gone, he'll be away. One of the things about the farewell discourse, you know, is obviously it's length um, and kind of wondering didn't he say that already? But I mean, there, I think there is something here that that gives a different dimension to how we understand, to how we're supposed to understand what life looks like now for us. Does that make and sense? You, yeah, I think so. I mean, what do you think that is? What is that different dimension? Well, I don't know. Part of it is this kind of sense of source, like source of mm. power. So apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you don't have the nourishment, right? A branch can't exist without uh, without a root system. So. Part of it is whatever empowers the church or believers to make a difference in the world depends on Jesus. That's not just a Holy Spirit that comes and makes you feel good or gives you energy. There's something there. At the same time, we also know there are plenty of people who do good in the world with no explicit or intentional connection to Jesus or the Christian church or anything like that. So fruit is obviously more than just doing good. Right? So I don't know. I guess it's this kind of this question of how are we still nourished by Jesus even in his absence. Thus the spirit is the connection that you're making. Well, maybe, I think it's more than that. I think this passage says it's more than just the spirit though. Or am I well, totally overcomplicating something that should be a lot simpler? No, I think, I, I, no, I think that's, I, I think it is more than the spirit. I mean, in, in, in part, it's another way for Jesus to 
emphasize really the, the interdependence and the interrelationship of Jesus, God, the Father, the Spirit, and the disciples. And which at, at the end of the day is, uh, is maybe not something that's entirely graspable uh, that of this, this unity, I am, I, they are in me and I am in them. And, you know, and, and, and you, it does seem like Jesus is saying things over and over again, uh, the same thing, but maybe that's because we, he has to say the same thing over again, because it's not something that we can actually, it, that we can actually grasp, um, and, or understand, and we're not meant to, we're supposed to feel it. Uh, we're supposed to experience it. And so I think that's part of it here. It's, uh, and Jesus is, of course, going to say more about that interrelationship in chapter 16 and then, and then of course, in chapter 17. Uh, and so it's a, I think it is, a, it is another way to maybe give a, a, a concretize uh, something that's a, a, an idea or an experience or a promise that seems uh, so out there. How can that possibly be? Does that... Does that kind of answer your question, Matt? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's um, yeah. I mean, it, it gets to questions about how does you know really important questions. How does Jesus still matter, mm -hmm. right? Beyond just being kind of the badge we wear, or beyond you know the the way we kind of rally ourselves to do good works or remind ourselves that God loves. You know, the, this idea of the power of Jesus still present, unleashed in the world seems to be. Well, really, and really important. That's more than just <clears throat> we talk about relationality so much with John, but it's always relationship for the sake of what. And I think that's part of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Well, and in part that that's going to be more of what we talk about next week, right? That the reality, um, and in chapter seventeen, is that this is always in the context of the fact that Jesus is saying they will still be in the world. The disciples will still be in the world. Uh, and the world will, you know, the world will uh, not like them, <laughs> or the world will reject them, or the world will not hear their witness. And so what is it that's going to be that sustenance uh, in, in those realities? And so that's, I think that's in part what this passage is speaking into, uh, is, uh, is the absolute dependence on the promises and love of Jesus that they have already experienced. Uh, and and it's, it's, the, it's that experience, it's that abundance that Jesus has demonstrated and embodied in his ministry. Uh, and then in the, uh, in the foot washing that, that, that is going to be that, that sustaining reality in the midst of the kind of fruit that the, that the disciples are asked to bear. And that primary fruit is the loving of the world uh, when uh, being sent into this world uh, when, when Jesus is no longer present. I wanna turn it, uh, just to make it a little more simple for a minute. Um, the, the metaphor of vines is probably lost on a lot of Americans because um, we're so much more urban. We're such an urban country now. And um, this is my wife's confirmation uh, verse in here, I am the vine. Uh, and my wife has become uh, a, a gardener in the last years. It's, it's her main hobby. Uh, and uh, I think this is a time to help people just get in touch with that a little bit. Us to, to try to understand and then give them maybe some simple ways of what does it mean to abide? I mean, how, how can you abide? You know, prayer, obviously worship, life and community, the sacraments, but that, that um, it's not just like, oh, I got to go bear fruit. What, how, what does that look like? It's also where, where does Jesus sustaining grace, uh, you know, um, how is it available to people? One of the things that I think we've discovered uh, parish pastors tell me they've discovered uh, during the pandemic is that their 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 uh, folks have found new ways to um, participate in the life of a congregation and stay connected when they can uh, when they can't be physically uh, present with one another. I think that's an important point, Rolf, because another uh, I think another invitation 
for this metaphor for the for the preacher is uh, is to think ecclesiologically, uh, and I and in I think in this period uh, as we move into what 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 is life like uh, after uh, after the pandemic and there's no going to use Shelley Rambo's words there's no going back to life before the storm uh, in terms of trauma theory and. And that uh, this, what it, how are we going to talk about what church is uh, and what do we mean by church? I had a great conversation this past week with Luke Powery at, at Duke about, uh, about defining church and what does, what, what does church now mean? How are we thinking about uh, ecclesiology? And so, and I, I want to hear that from, I want to hear that from preachers that, uh, the way in which uh, they're talking about how church, how are we defining church now? And I think that could be an opportunity. One other thing about this passage, and I know we need to go on, is verse six, uh, whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Uh, that, that, sounds, uh, that, that sounds exceedingly judgmental, uh, and it has been used that way. And I want to put it back into the context of this passage that uh, this is, this is, these are words of promise to the disciples. You are the branches. And to what extent verse six is a statement of simply reality and not judgment. Uh, that who, and, and remember this, this gospel is not about Jesus judging or God judging that we judge ourselves based on our response or our reaction to Jesus. And so whoever does not abide in me is thrown away, that's the same balo, it's the same word that's used as for the man born blind, thrown out. Uh, and that's not something that God does or Jesus does, but you feel yourself as cast out because you are not in the vine. So if I wanted to clarify that. Acts eight. <gasps> Thank you for your commentary. I, I enjoyed writing it so much, I made it about twice as long as it needed to be. <laughs> So I think I'm going to let you talk about it. You too. So I disagree with one thing in the commentary though, Matt. And uh, that is when you said about the Ethiopian eunuch, um, that castration uh, was a condition for his position. I'm not sure the answer to the question matters much for interpreting the passage. And I actually think it, it matters somewhat. How so? Uh, well, as I understand, uh, and kind of, I've talked about this uh, in years past on the podcast um, that, you know, we don't, we don't have this, thank God for the most part, we don't have this practice um, in the world today of uh, castrating people for uh, empires, you know, creating a whole caste of people called eunuchs by castrating them. Uh, usually before, uh, usually before, um, you know, adolescent hormones start and therefore they're visible. I mean, you can you can tell who's a eunuch because they're the men without beards and they're more fleshy uh, in general, but that often it would, it would often be, as I understand it from the Old Testament in ancient Near Eastern context, it would often be um, members, sons of the, of the king who will, are, are not in the line of succession and therefore they're intentionally castrated so that they can't be a threat to the crown prince. But that, and in fact, if he, if he dies, they'll probably be killed. So, and therefore they're, they're trustworthy. So you put them in charge of things in the, uh, in the royal household uh, because they, they can't be king because there's laws, eunuchs can't be kings. And they're, they're going to be fiercely loyal because if the king is killed, they'll probably be killed. I mean, all, all in all, though, it's, 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 this is what empires do to people. Empires literally dehumanize people. In this case, part of these people's humanity is, is cut off. And uh, I th I, so I think for the eunuch then to be, have this place in Christ's family, is uh, it's 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 so countercultural to the ancient world. Such good news, I think. Well, and one of the uh, one of the aspects of your commentary that I appreciated, Matt, is again what we were talking about last week of that of the way in which Acts uh, 
uh, it, Acts promise uh, is one eight uh, that that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and that you say, you know, we've already been in Judea and Samaria, and here we are um, at the ends of the earth and whatever that is, wherever that is. And I think that's a great homiletical um, entry, where 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 wherever that and the ends of the earth is. What, how do we imagine that? What does that look like? Uh, how are we as a church uh, moving um, moving into that space? And kind of like, you know, and the last, and your discussion, Rolf, like the last person on the planet <laughs> that you would think would be, uh, be invited into or to realize uh, and that's the second point I wanted to make about your commentary with regard to this is a moment of constructive theology uh, that the that the eunuch is not only about and you know in is the is representative of this ends of the earth but takes on this in critical role in in engaging in constructive theology. What does this mean? Uh, what does this mean that this is who Jesus is and this is who Jesus is for? And so I think that that sort of double uh, double investigation in a sermon, I think would be uh, I think would be really fruitful in that, you know, okay, where where is that ends of the earth? How do we imagine that to be? Uh, how, how are we engaging in that work? How are we witnessing to that as called by one eight? Uh, but then what are we seeing when we get there? Uh, what are we are we engaging in the kind of constructive theology that is necessary when the when the stone is rolled away from the tomb, or do we default to to uh, certain claims about who God is and what God is up to based on tradition or what we've always known or what we're supposed to say? And this is an invitation into doing theology um, in that moment of whatever and wherever we discover uh, God's presence. So th that that's a place I would go. Yeah, it's uh, so one of the questions people just might wonder. So how could there be Jews in Ethiopia? Is that at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, we know that, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, Judeans fled to Egypt and they even had a temple down there at uh, Elephantini. Uh, and uh, to this day, there is uh, there are a group of Jews in Ethiopia who practice who whose worship uh, life um, seems to be first temple, uh, not I mean so very old, and uh, who claim uh, lines back to the first temple. Uh, so I think it is. I, um, I agree with what you say. It, it appears that this is a Jew, you know, uh, who has come to worship. Uh, the the church in Ethiopia is booming right now. I mean, there's a chance to think about all sorts of wonderful things in connection with the witness of this passage. Anything else, Matt? It's a great passage. It evokes a lot of imagination. And um, I, I think like what you said, like I said in the commentary, the, the challenge is how do you find a character who represents so much otherness and is so liminal, literally in so many ways yeah. uh, and ambiguous and and not turn that into a, a sideshow or a spectacle where you further dehumanize him as well. You know, so yeah, how do you, good point. how do you, um, how do you walk that balance, right? Saying that the, the liminal people aren't necessarily out there. It's partly us and how we think about center and, and edges. Uh, we need to be careful of our language on that, but also be careful of our own propensity to, to do just what Caroline was talking about, right? Kind of march out there and say, hey, guess what? <laughs> We've already defined who you are and what you believe, and now we're here to tell you about it. And maybe even to put ourselves in the place of the, uh, I think that's a very important corrective that to, how is it that we put our place, ourselves in that place? Um, you know, we're, we're, we weren't the insiders. <laughs> and so, uh, and so what does it mean actually to say baptism is for me? I mean, and that's that constructive theology, I think that, 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 that it could invite. Yeah, I mean, the great question, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and... Uh, but how often maybe we think that? One, one of our graduates a few years ago was baptizing somebody on this particular Sunday and looked up and said, what is to prevent you from being baptized? Nothing. Hey, if you haven't been baptized, come up. And somebody came up and got baptized. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great 
move. I, I, let me just say one thing about 25, Psalm 25, uh, 22 rather. It's We're already uh, at over 21 minutes, so we need to not say much about it. I wrote about this exact Psalm. It was Lent too. It just came up. Uh, here, it's a response to the Acts reading because it says, it just talks about the praise of God going down, you know, out to the ends of the earth. Um, and so it's, it's a response to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch uh, that all the families of the nations shall worship, right? So, but let's say a quick word then about the epistle for people who have been uh, or who may be preaching uh, on First John through Easter season. This, I read this passage and I think not just of cross and resurrection, I think of incarnation as well, which, mm. which is of course, uh, sorry, which is, if you didn't know, one of the key issues driving First John as a whole, that there seems to be debate about whether who Jesus really was and whether, whether he was really human or not. So just to notice this, that, to think about the love of God being poured out this is a passage that certainly directs our attention to the cross and to the tomb, but also to the whole wider story. And so I, I yeah. like most New Testament scholars, I am all about trying to break down those divisions between the first three quarters of each gospel and the passion narrative and help people see that all of these fit together need to be told in meaningful ways so that we don't imagine Jesus as simply the one who came to die. Well, and that that's where with this particular passage, you know, we, what we have skipped over in uh, in this lectionary designation is the key verse to interpreting uh, the, the this section, and that's uh, four two. Uh, By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Uh, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus um, is not from God in the flesh. And so that's the litmus test. Uh, that's a litmus test for uh, for giving witness and uh, to to God's activity is that is that is the incarnation, and so uh, so the preacher would, might want to pull on four two to uh, lodge it into that it, to that promise uh, that First John is trying to uh, trying to uphold. Would you advise adding verses or just you know reference it in the sermon? Uh, Whatever. Preacher's discretion. <laughs> Preacher's discretion. Do whatever. Do what you want, but definitely, definitely go back to four two.